everyone. I'm Katherine Mortensen. Did you know that the average American driver can expect to pay about $2,400 in gas this year? That is more than double what they were paying about a year ago, which was $1,000. Thank you for joining us today for this Alec TV live stream. Joining me here in the studio is Lee Schalk. He's our vice president of policy and Joe Trotter, who heads our energy task force. He also looks at agriculture and what's the other one? Agriculture, energy, energy environment, and agriculture. environment. So what we want to get to today is the gimmicks that are going out there in the public policy sphere regarding the price of gas, how to make it more affordable, generally how to bring the costs of energy down. And Joe, you recently co-authored a piece called Gimmicks and Gas Costs, in which you broke down in a very easy to understand way exactly what has been causing gas prices to soar to the seven year high. Um, so before we bring on Jonathan and Thomas, we'll, we'll get to um, our, our guests, but Joe, can you explain sort of what the research shows? Because I, I know you can go back to college econ. What, what are the things here? So yeah, let's start with uh, econ 101. Uh, prices are set by supply and demand. Now, recent research by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis shows that basically uh, the, the gasoline price increases of the last decade have not been driven by long-term increases in demand. Now, what is happening is a supply side problem. And uh, I think Lee is gonna talk a little more about that. Well, of course th there is a huge supply side problem, but I think what's also gonna be interesting to touch on today in light of the rising energy costs and the pain that Americans are feeling at the pump are the GDP numbers that were revised down for the first quarter just a couple of days ago the U.S. economy shrank by 1.6% in the first quarter. And across the country, when we look at the energy producing states, they are suffering even more. New Mexico, uh, about 4.7%. Mm -hmm. um, their economy shrank by about 4.7% in the first quarter. So there's a lot of pain being felt around the country. And a lot of that has to do with the attack on American energy producers. Yeah, absolutely. We know that energy is the lack of energy production is driving down those growth numbers all across the country. So that would be the supply side, right, Joe, that we're talking about. You've got your demand, which we've shown is not causing prices to go up. It is constriction it's, of the supply, right? It is. And there, the, well, yeah, the demand has not increased. The supply has decreased. And part of that stems from the pandemic in, in terms of gasoline, diesel, everything like that. Uh, basically, as the demand at that point constricted, uh, energy producers turned around and, and started shutting down some of their facilities and not doing some maintenance because it, it did not look like it was going to pick up again. And in previous times when there has been an increase in demand, it has been short term, and the producers have responded to that uh, basically by spending on infrastructure that wound up has not panning out. So today we, we have some of the lowest production of gasoline, diesel, just general refining of these fuels, and it hasn't picked up because the, the producers are worried that there are there's uncertainty in the markets down the road. So we want to bring on Jonathan Williams and Thomas Savage. Uh, they're, they've already been there, so you can see them into the conversation. Jonathan is our chief economist and executive vice president of policy. So clearly, Jonathan, what we want to be looking at here are what are actual solutions versus some of the gimmicks that we're seeing from the Biden administration. Um, and Thomas, you co-authored the piece with Joe looking at the gimmicks and gas costs. So we want to hear your voice on this. Uh, Jonathan, the first thing I want to ask you is uh, President Biden, uh, among the many different sort of scapegoats he has had in recent months for the high gas price, he's saying is um, greed by the energy producers. Is there any truth to that? Well, no, I, I think it's, um, you know, what you were talking about earlier is back to economics 101, which are prices are set by supply and demand. And that's clearly what's happened in that supply, you know, restrictions that we've talked about here. 
um, in, in many ways, whether it was the decisions on Keystone and pipelines from day one or to stop the new uh, leases on uh, federal land for oil and gas production nearly from day one of the Biden administration. Um, other things, going back to the war on energy in the, in the Obama administration and really stopping building and new refining capacity here in the United States. Uh, we've seen this go on for far too long, and now we're paying the consequences, unfortunately, with much, much higher prices. Now, when you look at what's happened, let's say, to the price of a barrel of oil just in the last month, it's gone from roughly $120 a barrel down to just over $100 a barrel today. And briefly, it had dipped below $100 a barrel. And so for those that think this is all about corporate greed, I guess corporate greed evidently went away over the last month as we saw the, the price of oil uh, tank like that. But no, it's clearly supply and demand. Now, the, the reduction in the price of oil currently, though, is uh, something that's uh, probably not for the right reasons. As Lee alluded to, we've got some real problems with economic growth in the country with the first quarter numbers. It's too early to tell on the second quarter numbers, but at least some of the Atlanta Fed uh, a tracker uh, has suggests that we may be in negative territory. Others suggest we may be in slightly positive territory for a quarter two. But that being said, I think it's the market expectation and reduction of demand with some sort of a real potential for global recession that led to the price of oil declining, not something that we would normally like to see with an increase in supply. And so I think when you talk about solutions, uh, that's what we need to be really looking at is how do we increase long-term supply, especially in the United States. So the feel-good political gimmicks of releasing you know, oil from our strategic reserves that evidently, according to some reports, have gone overseas instead of helping American consumers, or the idea of even uh, gimmicky gas tax holidays, uh, things that are feel good political proposals from the Biden administration, but do nothing to address the supply side needs to really get oil and gas prices under control here in the United States. But Tom, you may want to add a few things to that. Yeah, sure. Happy to happy to hop on. Um, thanks for having me on. You know, as um, as everyone said here, we're we're at a point where uh, energy production is incredibly low and the problem is on the supply side, not the demand side. Um, so as Jonathan mentioned just a couple seconds ago, that strategic petroleum reserve, which uh, for those who aren't familiar with that, that is a reserve of oil which is intended to supply the United States with oil during times of war. And so you would really ideally only want to tap into that during the ca extreme cases such as you know, such as a case of a hot war. Um, and we are living in a world where countries like Russia and China are growing increasingly aggressive. And as Jonathan mentioned uh, yesterday, it came out in Reuters and several other several other news sources that uh, bar about 5 million barrels from this strategic petroleum reserve was going out to countries in Europe and Asia. And now when you have that at a time when supply is incredibly restricted, it's not the it's not the smartest move, especially as Lee mentioned, you know, um, Americans are feeling the pain at the pump. Um, and it's, you know, as 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 they've mentioned also, you know, that's you it gas tax holidays might seem very feel good, but gas tax relief addresses demand problems, not supply. Actually, when you have restricted supply like we do right now and you reduce gas taxes, um, those uh, that may actually increase demand because people will know the gas tax holiday only lasts for a certain period of time. So they'll say, well, we better get our driving in now. And so at, with de as demand increases, but you restrict supply, either the price is going to go up or you'll have a situation like over the weekend where the president uh, was telling gas suppliers not to raise their prices and you'll end up with gas shortages. Well, one of the things that I wanted to ask, I guess Joe might be the best person to ask this about is President Biden in recent weeks has been going out and sort of begging energy producers to produce more, but yet we all know he's very, he's been very much on the record with sort of attacking energy producers. So why is his approach not working to sort of like first he attacks them, now he's begging them to produce. I mean, it just seems rather pathetic. Yeah, so there's a concept uh, advanced by the economist Robert Higgs called regime uncertainty. 
and he may be calling for these short-term increases, but at the same time, the, the gas producers and, and everyone else is going to have to live with whatever happens after the fact, after it's no longer popular for him to, to boost his poll numbers. And so these producers are just saying, why would we do that when we're going to have to pay for the aftermath of that and you're going to turn around and attack us? And a great example of this, and an additional to the ending the leasing on federal lands, which has just been ongoing since day one, last week the EPA announced that it's looking into uh, using a rulemaking uh, about um, basically emissions in the Permian Basin. And the Permian Basin is part of Texas and New Mexico and the southern states. It's one of the highest oil producers in the nation. And the rule would basically tamp down on the ability for these companies to extract oil. And this is a, actually an attack on, on private properties to some extent, because a lot of these oil fields, Texas is only about 1.7% federal lands. This rule would, would essentially shutter oil production in Texas on private property. So he can get on TV and, and wave his arms and make demands. But at the end of the day, he's kneecapping everyone, who, whether they're on federal lands or private property. Yeah, I mean, I think that's so true. If you're a company and you've been under attack by the Biden administration for, you know, as long as they've been in office, as long as Joe Biden has been in the White House, um, you know, the media has kind of given cover to a lot of those efforts that have taken place to kneecap American energy independence and really discourage these energy companies from expanding their production. You know, it's one thing to go on and sort of lecture private companies to expand production or, or bring prices down, but they have to think about the long-term implications of something like that. Um, and so they can obviously expect, to your point, if there was a second term for this administration, um, we may be, he may be right back to pursuing those policies that harm American energy independence. But right now, it seems like the message is just bring down prices because I say so. Okay, hang on. I want to make sure that, uh, oops, wrong format. Uh, Jonathan, what are some of the other actual solutions, not gimmicks, but things that state policymakers can look at? Well, you know, clearly, if um, there are states that have proven oil and gas reserves that are on not federal land and on uh, private land or state land, they could certainly decide to start exploring. Um, that's one one way. I mean, you think of clear examples like New York uh, with Marsalis Shale and uh, California and other states that are sitting on just uh, huge amounts of American energy uh, that have decided not to produce for whatever reason uh, with the environmental politics in those states. But there are lots of examples of those of, of states that could explore more. But then you look at other ideas, uh, for instance, like, you know, how do we make Americans whole when it comes to the just the, the, the massive problem and draining of their paychecks uh, due due to higher gas prices and you know, there's lots of ways to backfill and make Americans whole and the good news is so many states out there are doing that you know we've witnessed a really historic session across the country with states looking to make long term uh, tax cuts that put more money back into the hands of individuals that do help backfill the cost that Washington is imposing on American families and to allow them to put food on the table and to allow them to uh, really keep up their well-being as families and small businesses. States are really stepping in the gap and making historic tax changes to put more hard-earned dollars back into the hands of uh, hardworking Americans. And so that that's great. And, you know, when, even when it comes to gas prices and gas taxes, uh, apart from the temporary gimmicks of gas tax holidays, uh, something that I've talked about for 15 or 20 years, which is how about we just cancel the gas tax federally and allow states to take up taxing gasoline. It gets to the Federalist issue. There's no reason that the federal government should be taxing uh, gasoline at 20 cents a gallon nearly. Uh, well, that's, that's, a, that's a prerogative of states to handle transportation and roads and bridges. It also uh, frees the states and American consumers of the cost of the regulation that come with the federal dollars. And so if we want to address gas taxes, let's do it holistically and get the federal government out of the business of taxing gasoline altogether. Well, Jonathan, those are really good points. And I think when we think about solutions, 
uh, and to the the problem of the national economy as a whole, that's where the states really come into the spotlight. Like you mentioned, we've seen taxes move or states move their tax system from progressive to a flat tax in four different states this year. We're seeing businesses relocate uh, to places like uh, Florida, Texas, Arizona, North Carolina, major companies like Caterpillar moving out of Illinois to Texas, Chevron moving from California to Texas, uh, other companies like te Tesla. And so there really is a big movement right now. We may not be able to, in the short term, find that immediate relief uh, on the higher energy prices, but what can we control? We can control where we live. We can vote with our feet. And you talked about this um, on your, your TV hit just the other day, that story in the Wall Street Journal, uh, which referenced that red states are actually winning uh, versus blue states. Red states have added over 300,000 jobs since 2020 when the pandemic really kicked off, whereas the blue states are still down um, about a million, 1.3 million jobs. And so there's so many things that Americans are able to do right now, whether it's uh, the job creators or the individuals themselves to um, live and relocate to states that have more pro-growth uh, free market policies, because, you know, we are all getting hit by inflation. Uh, and a lot of that is due to actions being taken at the federal level. But there are a lot of things that states and state lawmakers can control. And that is their own state level policies. Yeah, I love that. I saw the map and they showed the three usual suspects, California, Illinois and New York State were the biggest you know, population loss. Um, it's the, I mean, people like you said, they're voting with their feet. They're like, I'm going if, 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 to you know, I'm going to make my own tax relief. I'm just moving. I'm, I'm going to go to a more free state. Um, Thomas, is there anything else you want to add? Because you, of course, co-wrote this piece, the gimmicks and gas costs. Um, is there anything that we didn't touch upon that's important for people to know about this? You know, I think it. Uh, we did hit on all the major points, but I, I wanted to hit home again that, well, we just, you need to think about, as Jonathan mentioned, that long-term supply growth and not just gimmicks, not just stuff that feels good. It feels good for the moment, but doesn't produce any results. You know, we... Quite frankly, the federal government just needs to end the war on American energy, and that is going to help supplies. And as Lee and Joe mentioned, uh, you know, people are voting with their feet and states, what states have in their power, what state leaders have in their power is to help make their states the most affordable place to raise a family and to start a business. And tax reform in the states that are working have come a long way. Um, Joe, any final words from you? And then we'll let Jonathan close it out. Tom and I talked at one point, and, and it was mentioned in the article, um, about what these gimmicks are, especially in, in regards to the tax holidays. At the end of the day, the, the highway funds and, and road repairs, which the, the gas tax supports, it, these repairs are, and creations are still going to need to happen. And so they may be you know, temporarily suspending this, but they're turning around and hitting taxpayer dollars in other regards. They're transferring from general funds in order to make up these shortfalls. It may be a short-term relief on gas, but it's going to be hitting Americans anyway at the end of the day. Yeah, they'll reach into our pocketbooks to, to grab that money out at some future date. Um, Jonathan, any final thoughts on this issue? Well, I mean, seriously, we have some some big, uh, I think, inflection points ahead as a country is to decide, you know, will we stop this war on American energy, whether it's through this ESG movement that we've talked about many times on other ALEC live streams that's really, really looking to cut off the uh, capital to investing in more energy uh, to address these supply issues that we've been talking about today? Um, or are we going to continue down this path uh, with the gimmicky political based solutions that we're getting out of the Biden administration? My hope as an optimist is that obviously I think Americans always find 
the right solution, even after some of the bad ideas are exhausted, that we will exhaust these bad ideas. And as we come through uh, the next uh, several quarters, maybe we'll have a much more free market looking Congress as we get into next year. And we'll really start to peel back some of the big government uh, ideas that have caused the inflation problem uh, and uh, really then start to empower states to give these uh, dollars back to American consumers through so many of the great actions that our ALEC members are accomplishing across the country. And when uh, you don't, don't take it from Jonathan Williams, chief economist at ALEC, when we see it on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, that the states that are following the ALEC message of limited government and free markets and federalism, uh, they're the states that businesses and individuals continue to move to. Uh, folks, I think we know what the real policy answer is, and that is more freedom and not less. Well, on that, we'll close it out. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, Thomas and Joe and Lee. I really enjoyed this discussion and I hope you'll join us next time for another ALEC TV live stream. Mm -hmm.